Good afternoon. Thank you for joining me today um, for the topic of understanding the impact of trauma. Um, my name is Kathy Brown, and I'm a licensed clinical social worker with uh, Blue Ridge Behavioral Health Care. We are the Community Services Board here in Roanoke, and we serve the areas of Roanoke, Salem, Botetourt, Craig, um, and let's see, Roanoke County as well. Um, I, we are part of the Roanoke Area Trauma Informed Community Network, and this community network um, came together in November of 2017. Um, Carillion Clinic is part of this collaboration, as well as the schools in the area, um, departments of social services, juvenile courts, court service units, um, the Children's Trust Network, and various others who um, are interested in a trauma-informed approach in how we work with the folks in our community, that we all um, speak the same language and understand the implications of someone who has um, experienced trauma and how that impacts their ability to function on a daily basis. So our first um, order of business is to talk a little bit about the objectives. Um, what we want to get out of today is to be able to um, realize the brain science behind um, what happens to an individual when they have a traumatic experience, um, recognize those re trauma responses or trauma triggers in children as well as in adults and in the parents that you work with. Um, we also want you to be able to have a working knowledge of the um, adverse childhood experiences assessment and um, understand practicing universal precautions when it comes to trauma. Um, so this slide indicates that, you know, the realize, recognize, and then be able to have responses um, to individuals who are experiencing trauma. Um, another important component is uh, resilience. We don't want to talk about the negative and, and the trauma without talking about what we do about that and how we protect folks. Um, and then we want to resist the urge to re-traumatize. So, um, Trauma in, in a very, uh, I guess, simple di uh, definition is a serious psychological injury that results from a threatening, terrifying, or a horrifying experience. Um, I think it's important to understand that trauma is in the eye of the beholder. And what we mean by that is that um, any experience or response to an injury um, can be different to, to people based on a number of things, um, the protective factors that they have in their lives. So, for instance, um, are, are these folks uh, from a two-parent household? Are they involved in community activities? Uh, do they have a spiritual life that they um, can rely on? Um, and then there's also other uh, factors that go into how one experiences trauma. Um, that's the temperament of the individual, their sex, uh, the age at the time of the trauma, as well as their birth order. Um, so one thing that we talk about in behavioral health quite a bit is the fact that it's not up to any of us um, to determine what is a traumatic experience. Um, the aftermath and the symptoms that someone might experience or, or might show at a later time is going to depend on or is going to indicate to us that they've been traumatized. Um, so this, this graphic just shows you that, you know, what we see when we, when we talk to um, individuals, when we assess and when we diagnose, is typically the tip of the iceberg. Um, so, some of the things that we may not um, be able to get to within that first time that we're seeing someone or even after several visits 
are um, some of the, you know, familial factors, generational factors that go into their makeup, um, their attachment pattern, uh, their, their support systems, um, their intellect, their trauma history, their social and emotional development. Um, so we all want, we want to bear in mind that all of these are going to have some bearing on um, a person's uh, um, impact that, that trauma has on them. My apologies, there's a major fire truck going down the street right now, so you probably heard those sirens. Um, so, um, one thing that we want to bear in mind is that trauma is not always going to be obvious. Um, sometimes it may, but it's not always going to jump right out at you. You're not always going to be able to look at somebody and say, wow, they obviously have experienced some trauma in their lives. Um, so we're going to talk later about those universal precautions that we can use to make sure that we're um, taking a trauma informed approach to the way that we deal with all folks. So um, these are just a few um, of the possible causes of trauma in someone's life. However, um, this is not by any means an exhaustive list. Um, here again, uh, where you know your birth order in the family, your temperament, your age at the time you experience these different things are definitely going to have an impact. Um, on how the trauma affects you. Um, and it's not going to be the same for siblings. Uh, one sibling may um, not have a traumatic experience from the divorce or you know death of a family member, whereas another sibling might. Um, but these are just some of a, of a great deal of causes um, that could, could perhaps trigger trauma in a person. Um, back in the 1990s, Dr. Robert Anda and Dr. Vincent Folletti got together um, to do a study. And um, Dr. Anda was from the Centers for Disease Control here on the East Coast uh, in Atlanta. And Dr. Uh, Folletti was with Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente being a large um, insurance carrier on the West Coast. And they used participants in the Kaiser Permanente healthcare plan to do their adverse childhood experiment assessment. Um, the original assessment was given between 95 and 97, although the participants that, that were used at that time were involved in long term follow up for health out outcomes. Um, the thing to bear in mind is that between 1995 and 97, when this um, study was done, um, we didn't have access to health insurance at, like we do now. So the people who were enrolled in Kaiser Permanente at that time were typically educated people, at least a high school diploma, a lot of college educated folks, um, mostly white participants. And um, that that makes this um, the results of this study very interesting. Um, there were the the ACEs uh, assessment is ten questions, ten very simple questions um, about what what are some things that might have happened in your life before the age of eighteen. So those questions are. Um, before the age of 18, did you suffer one of these three types of, of abuses, which is emotional abuse, sexual abuse, or physical abuse? Um, did you have uh, any experiences of neglect, be it physical or emotional neglect? And did your family um, have any of these uh, situations occur? An incarcerated relative, a mother, um, treated violently or, you know, um, a household with domestic violence, um, a household with a family member that experienced mental illness, uh, parental divorce or uh, substance abuse. 
So these make up the 10 ACEs questions. And um, these statistics that you're seeing on your screen right now are actually the, um, the responses to those 17,000 participants. And as you can see um, in the, that mostly white educated group of folks, you had um, more than half, uh, excuse me, more than a quarter of those folks experienced substance abuse in their families. 28% um, experienced physical abuse. Um, almost um, a quarter of those folks experienced sexual abuse. Um, so ACEs are much more common than, you know, than we would think. Um, based on, you know, just thinking about these questions in a nutshell. Um, the other interesting thing that they found out in this study is that um, where there's one ACE, there's likely to be more. And um, the higher the ACE score, the more likely individuals are going to um, participate in these behaviors, which is, you know, could be smoking, alcoholism, drug use, which you think of those typically are of self-medicating behaviors, um, missing work, lack of physical activity, which of course lead to these physical and mental health symptoms, such as diabetes, obesity, depression. Um, what we see a lot of times when we are working with children in the community is that you may have a parent that um, has a substance use disorder. Um, and that can often lead to a situation of domestic violence, uh, can lead to incarceration if uh, the parent steals to support their drug habit, um, can also certainly uh, result in the neglect and sometimes the abuse of children. Um, so it's typical to, to see more than one ACE. Um, and, and overall, what the studies show was that four or more ACEs greatly um, increases the, the chance that uh, people are going to have physical mental health issues in adulthood. Um, we also talk about um, cumulative trauma, so repeated and prolonged exposure to traumatic events without adequate support. Um, and this is particularly in an early age when children do not have the ability um, to tell a caregiver what they want or what they need. So they may um, have an, um, a, what we call an insecure un, um, attachment. Um, where they're, they don't know where their meal is coming from, they don't know when they cry, who's going to be um, responding to their needs. Um, those can definitely have a long-term impact on someone's well health and well-being. Um, we call this toxic stress, and what this is is um, when when you see the fight, flight, or freeze response to a, to a trigger occurring in trauma, um, these are, are repeated, um, kind of keep you in that sense of fight, flight, or freeze for a prolonged event, um, prolonged period of time, which is, is like having a burst of adrenaline that continues on. Um, I compare this to, um, used to be when I was a kid growing up, you had a, a lawnmower that you would um, pull the, the string up to start the mower and you would open the choke all the way and you open the choke and it would start up and it would rev up real high and then you would adjust the choke down to where you wanted it. So what I, what I compare these kids that we see that have had that repeated fight, flight and freeze is kind of like their choke gets stuck open and that they're in that high gear all the time and they, they don't have the ability to regulate their own emotions and come back down out of that um, sense of, um, of guarded um, this, you know, that they experience when they have this uh, cumulative trauma. 
Um, another thing to consider is particularly when you consider someone's uh, race or culture or, or oftentimes a population of people is that there can be a group traumatic experience. And, um, you know, one of the, uh, I guess, most predominant um, group historical traumas that we think about in um, our country's time is slavery and, of course, also um, Native American populations. Um, but this is um, something that impacts the entire community and is transmitted across generations. So in addition to, you know, the individuals, the individual traumas that someone might experience, they may also have um, inherited some historical trauma as well. So um, epigenetics uh, is the emerging area of research that indicates how an environment um, influences the expression of a child's genes. Now, the good news um, in all this is that even if um, genes are impacted by toxic stress or um, impacted in, in um, other ways, they can that that can be reversed. So it's important to remember that ACEs are not destiny. Um, so if I have a score of three um, from my adverse childhood experiences uh, assessment, and I marry a man who has an adverse childhood experience score of four, that does not necessarily mean that we're going to have children who have a scores of seven. Um, one of the things that is so important for the trauma-informed community network right now is that we get this information out and educate people that about adverse childhood experiences so that parents can understand and break that cycle. Um, so it's very important to remember that, that just talking about the trauma is not the end of the story. Um, another thing that we've come to realize, I think, more so um, is that um, income is going to affect um, ACEs scores, especially in situations where children have experienced four or more ACEs, um, although higher income is not necessarily found to be a protective factor, because as we know, you can still um, have a mental health uh, diagnosis or an SUD, excuse me, substance, substance use disorder and have a high income. Um, but we do see that children um, of different races and ethnicities don't experience ACEs equally. Um, I'm going to show you all what I call a, a kind of a quick and dirty um, example of the brain. This is great to be able to kind of explain to parents what's happening with their children. And at the end of this, um, this PowerPoint is a um, link to go to a uh, about a five minute film clip that Dr. Allison Sampson Jackson did on um, the hand model of the brain, which gives you a little more explanation. But this is how we teach children and help them understand what happens when um, their brain experiences trauma. So this is the hand model of the brain. This is basically the lower region of the brain, the downstairs um, limbic region, which is something that uh, we're born with, which is the, um, the, the ability to breathe, uh, breathe in and out, this is where fight, flight, or freeze lives. This is the primitive portion of our brain. And then over the top here on the top of our brain is the um, middle prefrontal cortex. Um, it is our executive functioning skills. It is the executive functioning skills have to be taught. So we aren't born knowing what is socially acceptable behavior. Um, we aren't born knowing how to practice impulse pulse control, all those are stored in our upstairs brain. So 
the way we describe um, a trauma trigger is that when a child is triggered, they uh, flip their lid. And what that means is their executive functioning skills basically go out the window. And what they're left with is operating down here in their primitive brain in that fight, flight, or freeze. And um, we often have children that tell us that during a trigger, they black out and they can't remember what happened. That's because honestly, they can't because they have lost their ability to articulate and communicate and, and that critical thinking piece of what actually did happen to me. And they are strictly in survival mode and downstairs brain. Um, it took us a long time to help educators understand that, that when children were triggered, that um, they didn't, it, it, we often heard, well, they, they don't have any remorse for their behavior. Well, they don't have remorse because they don't understand it because they don't know exactly what happened. Um, so this is a great way to explain to parents what is happening to their children at a time when they're triggered. Um, an example that we often use is kindergarten child who goes into school on her first day. And this child has a history of sexual abuse by an uncle. And um, when she goes into her classroom to meet her teacher, her teacher's Mr. Jones. And when Mr. Jones bends down to greet her, she catches a whiff of um, his old spice aftershave. Well, this uncle that sexually abused this little girl wore Old Spice aftershave. So as the child um, is maneuvering through the classroom to get to her seat, something hits her. She doesn't understand what it is. All she knows is that she senses danger and she's got to get out of the room. So she runs out of the room and out of the building of the school. And of course, she gets the reputation of a child with a problem. Um, what's going on with this kid? She's gonna be a runaway. She's gonna, you know, be an eloper. But the reality is she sensed danger and she didn't know why. Um, so that's the kind of experience that a child has when they've been triggered and they honestly don't understand and know what's happened to them. Um, this also kind of drives home that, um, that knowledge of the difference in a healthy and, and an abused brain, as you can see in these um, PET scans and how uh, the, the um, healthy brain is the most active brain and has um, it, you know, the one that's lit up. And then you have the abused brain, which has a lot of the gaps um, where learning um, should, should have taken place. So what can we do about some of these things? We talk about um, what we wanna do to create a trauma-informed environment for folks. We wanna be able to create safe physical spaces. Um, don't overcrowd your furnishing. Uh, keep things relatively simplistic. Um, make sure your decor is culturally sensitive. Um, we talk about practicing universal precautions, and in just the same way as we have to wear our mask when we walk out of our offices now, um, practicing universal precautions in um, trauma-informed care is treating each person as if they have a trauma history. So we don't know when we see people, and we want to make sure we treat everybody um, Sensitive, sensitively. Um, each time we ask somebody to tell their story, there's a risk that we're going to re-traumatize them. So let's not ask people to repeat their traumatic experiences over and over again. Ask permission um, before you put your hands on someone and be aware of body language. These are just a few of the ways that we can treat people as if um, they have a trauma history if we're not sure whether they do or not. Um, the other piece of the um, equation is to let adults know that it's really important when children have experienced trauma um, that the, the adults who interact with them need to be self-aware. Um, parents, um, it, it's really important for parents to understand what their own triggers are. 
um, because sometimes their children can trigger them. Um, and to be able and willing to ask for help from another adult um, if there are certain circumstances or situations that they feel overwhelmed and aren't able to handle. Um, and then, of course, we have to be on the lookout of vic for vicarious trauma uh, because as um, helpers, um, we will sometimes serve as a container um, for people's trauma, and um, we need to have the ability to take care of ourselves and be able to, um, you know, you, you can't drink from an empty cup, I think they say. So we have to keep our own cup filled in order to make sure that we are able to help someone else get through their circumstances. So, as I had indicated earlier, um, we don't want to end a trauma discussion without talking about resilience. Um, resilience is the ability to overcome obstacles and not only to survive, um, but to thrive. And resilience um, can be something as simple as a connection with one caring person in your life. Um, a lot of times with children, the um, resilience that they glean is from someone in their in their school. Um, it's from their own academic achievement. Um, it can be, you know, in the closeness of friends that they they make, as well as their talents, um, uh, whether it be, you know, athletics or music or just intellect. Um, but also, of course, neighborhood safety and um, and your uh, spiritual community. So all these things that are combined together create resilience and create protective factors for children. Um, and those are great things to talk to parents about. Um, is what are the natural supports in their life? Dr. Vance, who's a child psychiatrist at Carillion. Um, has a resilience uh, checklist that he uses from with youth um, to give them some ideas or, or what are some of the things that they can do to create resilience in their life. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's really important to take away uh, the message that um, we don't want to look at trauma as being What's wrong with you? Um, we want to change the paradigm um, and look at the question of what happened to you. And when we look at folks from through that lens, then we tend to um, have a better understanding and, and more compassion about what exactly it is that they've experienced and what, um, what can we do to help them uh, create protective factors to build that resistance of, excuse me, build that resilience so that they are able to um, continue on and thrive um, in the rest of their uh, life. So I'm going to end by letting you look at these references here, the hand model video that I mentioned earlier. Um, certainly, if you all are in need of additional information or if you ever have any questions or concerns about children that you're treating, um, please contact us here at Blue Ridge. Um, we are the community service board and um, we're here to serve our localities. Um, also, I welcome your questions. Um, I'm more than happy to um, respond to those and appreciate your time today and um, appreciate your interest in continuing on to create a trauma informed culture in our um, in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kathy, for your time today and all your work in trauma informed care. Um, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time and we will not be able to uh, take any questions, but if anybody does have any questions, please feel free to reach out to outreach at carillionclinic.org and we will we'll make sure that uh, we get those questions answered for you. Um, Kathy, thank you again and uh, everyone have a great and blessed day.